Give a very warm welcome to Christoph Engemann and Anton Schlesinger. Hi. Yes, um, thank you. Um, this is a bit intimidating, large space. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, the topic of this talk is a new audio format called MQA, um, Master Quality Authenticated. And as, as the title of our talk suggests, it's more than just an audio format. Um, and in order to explain how we arrived at the title, A Clever Stealth DRM Trojan, uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, and our ta talk is structured as you see here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about audio files and audio files. Uh, then Anton here is going to ex uh, examine some of the claims um, that are being made about master quality authenticated. Um, then we will move on to 24 bits, got some room to spare, to have a look where they actually hide their DRM. And finally, um, we're going to make some remarks why we think uh, MQ is actually quite clever. <coughs> so, uh, wait. So, it's good to be back here. Um, some of you may know me already, as I've spoken at the uh, conferences a couple of times before, and mostly on policy-related uh, issues, on identification, um, digital identification uh, and authentication-related issues. This time, I have to make a confession. I am an audiophile, and I believe that this cable sounds different than this cable. So. I should be a millionaire. As some of you may know, the James Randi Educational Foundation had offered a million dollars to anybody who was able to identify the difference between two audio interconnects like these ones in a controlled ABX testing. Um, here is a 10-year-old uh, um, report on this uh, challenge. Of course, nobody managed uh, to find these differences and win the million dollar. And I'm pretty sure I would fail at that test too, but in my own experience, if I put one of these cables in the system for a week or two and then the other cable um, for another week, there will be some preference that emerges. And I cannot explain that, and I, um, but I guess if you ask me to ABX a mattress, the subtle differences in texture and softness um, won't be noticed by me by just laying down on them. But if I get to sleep on each of these mattresses for a week or so, I might develop some sort of preference. I make this point here, and I'm sure Anton, who is more on the objective side of things when it comes to audiophilia, will be skeptical about it. But what I want to illustrate is that we are talking about a market that operates and exploits the limits of perceptibility and where environmental and habitual factors play a role in what you sense and what you notice. And I believe that certain markets have developed around those perceptible limits and exploit something like long-tail phenomena in the distribution of perceptibility among humans. In other words, in a saturated consumer electronic, electronics market, there are a certain class of devices which offer just noticeable differences, and these can be commercially attractive and command premium prices. To illustrate this point further, let me ask you, who of you here is a gamer? Quite a few. Okay, so how many of you have a 240 hertz monitor? Oh, two, okay. How many of you have a high polling rate mouse? Quite a few more. Um, do you believe this makes a sorry? This makes a difference in your gaming experience. Okay, these are all objectivists here, skeptical people. Okay, <clears throat> um, values like 240 hertz refresh rates are 
astonishingly high. And if you tell somebody 20 years ago that people are able to discern 60 hertz refresh rates from 100 hertz refresh rate or 240 hertz, they'd have told you that the latency of the human visual system is far exceeded at these rates and everything, everything about 60 hertz is moot. Yet Apple now sells you 120 hertz iPad and the difference is perceptible for many. It turns out that peripheral factors like head movement, haptic interaction with the screen and so forth uh, modify certain uh, thresholds of visibility. In the VR context, this created big headaches and anybody who follows John Carmack's twi Twitter feed will know that he continuously is surprised that some of his subjects are very sensitive towards visual artifacts that normal users don't notice. So it's very easy to make fun about all your files and their $2,000 Ethernet cables. This is one of these and notice the small error there. Um, that's probably there because packets otherwise would get confused which way to go. Um, so these kinds of gadgets and there are many, many uh, examples of those, of course, um, give ample ground to make fun of audio files. But that's not what we wanna, what we wanna do here today. Instead, we want to look at master quality authenticated this new format as a development in the audiophile world that deals with these aforementioned limits of perceptibility and in a clever way exploits them to create and legitimize a new distribution channel for audio content. And we furthermore believe that these developments have possible repercussions outside of the audiophile world and might affect music consumers and producers, and that is you, um, and labels and the way uh, music is distributed in profound ways. So again, um, MQA stands for Master Quality Authenticated and promises studio sound at home. This is the MQA website, or this is some page on the website. Join the revolution in recorded music. Um, and there's a lot, of, uh, lot to unpack in this statement, master and quality and authenticated. Um, to give you a little bit an idea why I'm talking about this, as I already said, um, I'm an audiophile, but I also um, sometimes spend time on the other side uh, of music, namely in music production. Um, I used to mention a metal band or co mention a metal band called President Evil. We called the Styles Donor Trash. Um, this is a great record. You just shouldn't look at the waveforms because it clips all the way through and has a DR of three for those people who know what that means. Uh, we toured with uh, Ministry and so forth. And on the other side of things, I um, also interested in uh, acoustic music. This is me at the Hansa Studio in Berlin, where, among others, David Bowie, Deppish Mode, and you too have recorded album, albums. And we recorded this uh, album by Beatrix Becker, which is piano and clarinet music and cello music and a wonderful record. So coming back to MQA, you will understand that as an audiophile and as somebody who... Um, likes to be in studios. I'm somewhat familiar with music production distribution and their marketing claims of studio uh, sound and take me into the studio and so forth, uh, of course, raise an eyebrow with me. And furthermore, somebody tells me or promises that they want to authenticate a digital file and not only raise my eyebrows, my professional curiosity is piqued. Um, I have given talks here about the history of authentication media and I publish on these issues uh, on the questions of media of authentication. So all things authenticating are of interest to me and MQA promises something like that. So what they say is it sounds uh, like what the engineers heard and they're going to authenticate that on your playback device. Everybody with basic knowledge of intellectual property enforcement and digital rights management by now should be a little bit skeptic about their claims. As we're going to show, um, this is rightly so, but the devil is in the details and MQR offers an interesting and clever design of how to bring digital rights management back into music and the music distribution context. As some of you may know, uh, the music, mu music industry has tried to do that several times and always failed to um, implement and sell digital rights management uh, to consumers. And uh, most distribution channels these days uh, and most files uh, come without DRM. So um, this again is the website of MQA and you can see 
uh, how they explain authentication, and they have this interesting term provenance. Um, and there is uh, the important thing is here the blue and green light that will light that will uh, go on on your um, device um, if an MQA file is played on this device and authenticated, and they promise sound like in the studio. Then, right? <coughs> so in order to understand. Um, what they mean uh, by quality in their acronym, uh, it's important um, to go back a little bit in history and give you a background about uh, digital audio. So what is quality? Uh, in the 1980s, um, digital audio was introduced. That means for the introduced to the consumer. Uh, here uh, you see the uh, CD as advertised by Sony. I think this ad is from 1984. Um, the underlying format of uh, the CD is Redbook Audio, um, where you have a signal that's sampled at 16-bit um, word depth uh, 44K, um, 44,000 times a second. And uh, with 16-bit, we have a dynamic range of 65,000 values to pre represent the difference between the most silent and loudest sig uh, uh, signal in the format. And with 44K, we can represent um, frequencies up to 22 kilohertz. This is about 10% higher than what humans was very good, and that usually means very young ears can hear. Most music today is recorded and distributed in this uh, format. The audio world standardized in 44.1K, uh, the video broadcasting uh, uh, world standardized on 48K, and those of you who have surround systems, uh, DVD or Blu-ray based, will be familiar with the 48K sampling rate. So, uh, in the 1990s, we need see another step. We see uh, music production becoming fully digital with digital audio workstations. Uh, the first 20 and 24-bit converters arrive in the studios. Um, we see higher sampling rates. So this is one of these converters from the from the 90s. Um, and the little 24 indicates that's, that it can do 24 bits. Um, and um, there was also an attempt to sell these higher uh, resolutions to the consumer in the late 90s with a li little bit different format. That's the SACD uh, introduced by Sony in 99. Uh, it's a different encoding scheme called uh, GSD. Um, offers 120, her, uh, uh, 120 decibels of dynamic range and uh, in its initial um, form went up to 30 kilohertz, so way above human hearing range. But as many of you know, this failed in the market. And there's, of course, an interesting backstory to this too because uh, the SACD was introduced in the very moment the patents for the CD uh, expired and uh, Sony tried to push a new format into the market and have a new patent and licensing regime um, to generate revenue. So why did the SACD and the supposedly higher quality fail? Not only because people couldn't really hear it. Um, um, on the turn of the 2000s we had MP3 and uh, MP3 pretty much um, owned the market and Steve Jobs um, put it best when he said, convenience beats quality. Um, and as you know, he turned around Apple basically on, uh, with the iPod, uh, which could hold in its initial form, I don't know, 5,000 songs or something. Um, and uh, Steve Jobs knew what he was talking about. Uh, he was actually an audiophile with a system worth north of 50K in his home and supposedly only listened to vinyl. Um, this together with Napster basically killed the music market um, and especially the market for high resolution audio as these formats are called that exceed the Red Book standard. Audio files, to come back to our storyline here, of course fought holy wars against MP3 and any form of lossy compression. They deemed the format as inferior and, and argued that it destroys a generation's hearing and even incites brain damage. And I was actually surprised that uh, Douglas Rushkoff made this argument too, MP3 is bad for you. Um, on, and he asked uh, down there, will the next generation of musical lis music listeners be able to hear reality the same way we did? So the idea is that we somehow lose uh, contact to reality if we are exposed to lossy formats. So, but however, Audiophiles too abandoned um, physical media 
And um, things like these uh, standalone digital audio converters uh, found the way in, in their systems or uh, streaming uh, amplifiers um, that either via USB or Ethernet allow you to stream music from local networks or from the internet into your system. And uh, these converters, you can see here, it offers DSD, which is the SACD format, and 1624 bits and higher sampling rates allowed access to high resolution, higher bitrate files. <coughs> so, um, this is important because we come back to this in the context of MQA. And, of course, you can ask about the, the benefit uh, of these kinds of devices and the audibility of uh, resolutions um, higher than 16-bit and 44-1K. Um, again, I think uh, there might be individuals that actually hear differences. Um, <clears throat> let's jump to the current decade. Um, 20, 20, 2010s, um, I think we are actually in a golden age for audiophiles because music um, comes basically into the house more or less uh, at very low prices uh, via streaming and furthermore um, they can actually buy lossless files uh, in resolutions up to 24 bit and 192 uh, kilohertz in online stores like this one is the French company Kubos and you can see that um, some of the, the contemporary current uh, records are actually offered in these formats. So you can buy the new uh, Björk um, record in high-res audio. I haven't, actually haven't looked at what resolution, I guess 2496 or something like that. And Kubos will even stream at that revolu uh, resolution um, over the internet. Um, there is this web little website um, where you can compare the, the different uh, offerings. You just enter some band or some music and it will list you um, the availability of these files uh, at different resolutions. So, again, in essence, the 2010s are kind of a golden decade for audio files. They got ducks and streamers in their homes and could play the files at the same resolution as they recorded, mixed and mastered in the studios. Um, in their homes. And it is this context, basically, that the master quality authenticated format was launched and promoted uh, in two uh, 2014. Um, there was a big launch event at the chart at this uh, high rise in London. Um, looks a little bit like this tower uh, in Middle Earth where Zauron resides. So, um, and um, they claimed uh, a revolutionary advance uh, in audio and to deliver studio sound at home. But not only that, and that's where the story gets interesting, um, the inventors, uh, credited as uh, Peter Craven and Bob Stewart, you already saw Stewart on the picture, I'm going, where is it? Uh, wait, uh, it comes back later. They backed uh, their claims with a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the Audio Engineering Society, and they say that MQA builds on advances in neuroscience, and they also sometimes say an advances in the sampling theory beyond Sh Shannon Nyquist, which are strong claims to make. So if you go to the MQA website, you will find uh, this explanation in the FAQ, how does it work, and it says MQA is based entirely on science, Specifically, it's based on new findings in neuroscience that have told us that the resolution of timing information is critical to our hearing and our ear-brain interaction. So, if you look in this um, paper published in the AAS proceedings uh, and look specifically at the neuroscience work cited there, it's, I think it's seven or something like that, there's only one paper that actually deals with humans. The other papers test hearing with Mongolian gabbrils and barn owls, right? And um, it's probably another mistake to believe that these animals have a very different uh, auditory system than we have and uh, that their hearing um, exceeds our uh, hearing when it comes to high frequencies. So, building on these neuroscientific advances, uh, they claim to correct for the time domain errors in the digital audio chain. Namely, errors introduced in analog digital converters, so when you record an analog uh, signal in the studio and uh, convert it to digital. Um, and um, they say that these would create temporal blur. This is what they here say. There's a problem with digital, dig, uh, with digital. it's called blurring. It's also from the website. Um, and this temporal blur is, the, is basically the main marketing mantra of MQA. 
And the quality argument, the argument that it sounds better, um, rests to a large part on this claim not only to bring the studio sound to the home, but by reducing this, what they call, temporal blur. Their format, their format, so they claim, contains mechanisms to cope and correct these temporal inefficiencies present in all digital systems uh, where an analog digital or a digital analog conversion takes place and remove that temporal blur. And reviewers in the audiophile press called these innovations revolutionary and claimed them not only to be audible, but to lift music to a whole new level. This is from an audiophile um, public, online publication, The Absolute Sound. They say, let the revolution begin. Um, and here they more or less compare Bob Stewart with Einstein. If you read this here, uh, this capture, this is Lord Kelvin up there. There's nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Lord Kelvin, five years before, Einstein's paper on relativity. And if you look deep, deep in the text, and I'm sorry for this, I know you can't read that now, um, but they basically bring forward Thomas Kuhn, uh, revolution, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, and talk about a, a paradigm shift in digital audio, and even come up with the Copernican model supplanting Plotemi's worldview, and so forth. Right? So big things are happening in audio right now. You probably haven't heard yet, but um, we are entering uh, um, a new paradigm, and we are currently, and the fact that we are standing here is actually an indicator of the, of the scientific crisis, because we belong to the old worldview and think, Probably not, right? So, um, there is, of course, a big debate happening in the audiophile world around claims like this. And um, much of this debate is happening uh, on a website con called Computer Audiophile. And um, there is specifically this thread, um, which was opened on January 2 this year, and it has amassed 250k views by now. It's really interesting because uh, there's a couple of, of really reputable be people uh, publishing uh, on, this, uh, on this forum in this thread. Um, there's, there have been many outspoken critics. One of them is mastering engineer Brian Lucy, who uh, has six Grammys and mastered, among others, Depeche Mode and Marilyn Manson and so forth. And he basically uh, said that the available MQR files that you can buy now or stream via the Tidal service were not created in mastering studios, but encoded in an automatic way somewhere, probably on the cloud. So the claim of MQA that you know, you get the sound uh, that the artist and the mastering engineer signed off on is definitely false for the MQA files available now. And we must presume that it remain f remains false because um, there is no commercial uh, converters available that include MQA encoding. So nobody running a studio can actually use this format right now. You have to send the files off in an encoding house where they get uh, encoded and signed. So, um, part of this controversy is, is a couple of uh, people online who um, did deeper de research. One of them is Akimago, a blogger, uh, an anonymous blogger, uh, who actually set up an internet blind test, uh, MQR core decoding where standards high-risk files. If you're interested in that, please look it up. It's actually pretty complicated what he does because uh, since the, uh, the encoders are not available, uh, we cannot uh, properly encode music in MQA. And in the past four years, uh, the company has not allowed anybody to basically send them files uh, in order to create uh, a proper comparison between uh, um, MQA encoded files and files that uh, in PCM or any other format that you would have. So Akimago invented a pretty interesting way to work around this uh, limitation. Uh, can go further into that if you want to uh, take this test, uh, look at this website. Um, Another uh, hacker that had a look in this is Mans Holgard, um, who is uh, who's working on the SOX uh, resampling uh, package, um, and uh, he has a GitLab ha uh, site up uh, where you find uh, filter coefficients of MQA uh, and tools to actually look uh, at the control bits and at the stream uh, at the control stream of MQA. Um, we will also list this uh, later in the. Um, uh, presentation once we put it up. So, to wrap up my part so far, in 2017, 24-bit files, as they're created in the studio and worked in the studio, uh, studio are available for audio files. 
So they can actually listen to what's happening in the studio in a way. Of course, there's other, you know, like the listening room and the, the playback change and so forth are other parameters affecting that, uh, what they hear. But does that actually matter? Um, because most music, as all uh, of you will know, gets consumed in lossy formats via Spotify or any other streaming service and listened on speakers like this, mono Bluetooth speakers. So in this context now, MQR promises lossless studio sound at home that is authenticated and they also um, promise a sound improvement via fixing the temporal blur supposedly happening in the AD and DA stages. So Anton, who actually works on these matters, will now investigate these technical claims a little further. Hi. So as uh, Christoph uh, introduced himself, I do the same. Uh, my background in digital audio. Christoph, it's um, changing slides by itself. Is there a way to press? All right. Um, so my background in um, digital audio started in 1993 when I bought this uh, CD player. Um, <coughs> together with an amplifier and two Heiko speakers. Uh, and uh, looking back at that time, it was uh, the only point in my life where I actually uh, carefully listened to audio quality uh, as a listener. Uh, I repeatedly listened to my favorite records, which were mostly dance music at that time, again and again. The player did uh, well and uh, still makes the job today. Um, later on in uh, uh, 2000, I started studying at the uh, TU uh, uh, Ilmenau, uh, close to Leipzig, uh, uh, and I heard the lectures of uh, Karl-Heinz Brandenburg, who led um, in the 90s a group that developed the MP3 uh, algorithm. And with that invention, I later, uh, in the decade, uh, in the last decade, I became a very convenient uh, listener. I uh, downloaded uh, continuously. And um, then in the current decade, I, uh, I'm streaming. So, nevertheless, um, or of course, Onkyo wants to sell um, a system again to me, and I'm inclined uh, to, do, to, to do a purchase uh, soon, but uh, not uh, the one that comes with MQA, and uh, why that is like that, I'm going to show uh, now. So apart from the DRM, I, I do not appreciate the audio quality of, uh, of uh, MQA. And uh, before we have a quick look at the audio te technology, uh, uh, let me state the following. There's not much information uh, out there from MQA on the algorithm itself. There are, Christoph mentioned it already, there are mainly two uh, papers, uh, convention papers uh, of the AES. Uh, there are patents which, of course, hide uh, the crucial parts and uh, increase their freedom to operate, so it's, um, it's uh, vague. But there's luckily a lot of information from engineers that, uh, that uh, looked um, into the details um, and uh, did a reverse engineering. So MQA is an encoder decoder system nested in a container such as FLAC, uh, free lossless audio coding, or Apple audio coding, or Apple lossless audio coding, ALEC, or the uh, Microsoft uh, WAVE container um, and uh, thereby can be read uh, and decoded by standard uh, audio um, players uh, in hardened software. Of course MQA wants to replace the entire audio chain, the entire audio chain of AD converters and DA converters and uh, wants to get uh, royalties also from the streaming services and uh, the, the main approach is to 
um, reduce the file size uh, such that you send a uh, 24 or a 22 uh, bandwidth uh, file um, over the internet. But nevertheless, by unfolding is it, you can still have the high res resolution audio. So the MQ MQA claims are there, it's uh, lossless, and it shall improve the audio quality. MQA is scalable. Uh, the more you pay, the more bandwidth you get. So from um, uh, the sampling rate, uh, 48 kilohertz, you can unfold it four times. And download prices are currently at uh, 2L um, higher than for the original high-resolution high audio, the 24-bit, uh, and sampled at uh, 192 kilohertz files. Important to know, the end user does not own the file. Uh, this has Im implications, for example, if you do a loudness, loudness uh, normalization on the file itself or a room compensation, you lose the, um, you lose the MQA um, uh, license, so to say, and it's reduced to CD quality or below. So one of those claims in the AES paper, which is uh, written at the bottom, is uh, we advocate uh, lossless compression, lossless processing, and hierarchical up-down sampling. We highlight the quality and efficiency gains possible if the encoder and decoder are mutually aware and each match to their analog converters. So this is a bold uh, claim and not based on evidence, so we look into that uh, Lossless compression in audio means uh, a redundancy, redundancy removal and the possibility to reconstruct the or original recording bit by bit, including the noise, whether the, and the noise belongs to the music or not. Lossy compression removes information, be it audible or not. So is MQA lossless? Shannon's entropy allows to, as allows to assess the maximum redundancy in an audio file that can be removed without information loss. So on a data set of music, uh, Stefan Hotto, um, a link is given uh, to his paper, not the link, but the paper itself uh, is given in the bottom of this uh, slide, uh, did a um, entropy optimization and flag uh, compression and reached for a certain uh, high resolution data rate uh, 50% of, um, of file size. Um, so this is quite a lot and uh, nevertheless uh, MQA however has a data reduction of uh, 57%. Um, And um, it, it's, it's um, obvious that this reduction, lowering the bit depths and changing the amplitude and phase response is a lossy process. Um, this is also highlighted in the paper that I give here by Stefan Otto. So, then slide six, the next claim. MQA approach of recoding results is superior in superior sound and significant lower data rate when compared to unstructured encoding and playback and has been enthusiastically supported in listening trials with a number of recording and mastering engineers, artists and producers. So this is a, a truly scientific wording that may give you an uh, impression of the uh, AES uh, publications that, um, that we have as the resource. Uh, and we analyzed that. Um, I uh, quickly take you through the uh, sampling process. On the left side you see uh, two columns. Uh, in the top you see a drawing of the sampling um, scheme. 15 minutes, yes. So we start with a band-limited analog time function, and this is then multiplied in the time domain uh, with a series of uh, pulses, uh, then in the 
third row, a uh, third um, line, we have the um, multiplication. Uh, the right uh, column shows you the um, frequency equivalent, and the uh, time discrete signal uh, gets quantized with certain bit depths. Bit, bit depths um, for high resolution, resolution audio, it's 24 bit per sample. And then, if you put an analog um, low pass filter on the on the signal, you can reconstruct the original analog uh, signal bit by bit, and um, at, at 24 bit, practically uh, equal to the original signal. What MQA uh, changes is, for for example, the the B, B uh, spline kernel for a sparse uh, scam, sampling scheme, and this shall improve the temporal resolution. It's um, they highlight. Uh, Christoph already mentioned that uh, they highlight the detection of uh, humans, uh, the ability to detect transients with uh, 10 uh, microseconds, and um, the kernel also shall match to the song. So, uh, a second uh, point is uh, they change the the um, low uh, the low pass filter for avoiding uh, pre ringing and for improving together with the kernel um, the time resolution, they call it deblurring and uh, compensation for signal distortions from the analog uh, digital conversion during the recording process. So is it uh, actually improving sound quality? Uh, the temporal resolution, oh, I should start with a listening test that uh, Christoph uh, already mentioned. Uh, there was no preference uh, towards uh, MQA compared to high resolution audio. In fact, uh, in some situations, standard high resolution audio was preferred. So, in terms of temporal resolution, is it improving uh, audio, uh, sound quality? Um, if you look at their um, claim, it shall allow for the detection of events that are as short as 10 microseconds, which would be a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. They call it deblurring from a 48 kilohertz sampled signal. This is uh, questionable, so I don't think uh, that's actually the case. Um, the next uh, point is: uh, Is it tuned to the song? Uh, at first, they call it. They 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 post to um, change the balance between time and frequency representation of their filters. Both are equivalent representations of a filter, but if they use an adaptive filter, we don't know actually what is, what is tuned to the song, so there's information missing. In terms of the minimum phase filter to suppress pre-ringing, um, pre, uh, minimum phase filters have their shortcoming, they change the um, frequency response, uh, the, the amplitude and the phase response that has been also shown by Stefan Hotto. And uh, in the last, um, uh, the last point that I want to make on that slide is uh, the apodization uh, in the time domain to avoid the ringing of the um, filters. Um, the minimum phase filter has um, a ringing after the center of the filter and uh, to improve also temporal resolution and uh, to compensate for the signal change. That is also a point uh, Stefan Hoto looked at, and he clearly shows that apodization, so windowing, uh, in fact, is a low-pass uh, filter and not uh, improving sound quality. So uh, do we need MQA enhancement based on today's evidence from neuroscience? Uh, we heard uh, we need a time resolution in that paper of uh, six mic uh, microseconds, um, and it was um, referred to the binaural uh, hearing, and in fact, uh, we are able to discriminate interval time differences with just noticeable differences of 10 microseconds. Those 
differences are, however, based on a central auditory comparison of sound waves be between the ears. And because of the spatial Nyquist uh, limit, only the fine structure of the frequency up to 1.3 kilohertz is uh, analyzed. And if we remember the, the barn oil, for example, has, of course, ears that are closer together, and that's why they uh, can even detect um, f um, differences that are smaller than, um, than in humans. So, and uh, from the media production side, uh, there's no need for an enhancement of audio from a scientific point as well as from an artistic point of view. The artistic concept with all variables, uh, composition, performance, practice, etc., is captured on multi-channel multi -channel files and the transmission chain has always been kept free from influences. Quote, the music is the message and um, finally interpreted by, the, interpreted by the auditory system. So we don't need a channel that is um, um, pre-processing what's going on in our head eventually. A general question, do we need a HR audio, high resolution audio based on today's evidence from neuroscience for listening to music? And uh, I have here a graph from Zwicker and Fasel on psychoacoustics. So the audible threshold in uh, quiet is uh, this uh, solid line and it shows clearly we are not able to listen beyond, let's say, 20 kilohertz. Moreover, music uh, has a uh, amplitude uh, spectrum with 1 over F, so beyond 20 kilohertz um, the sound power is very faint and it's, uh, from my point of view, um, hardly uh, I can hardly imagine that uh, we are able to listen um, beyond 20 kilohertz. Nevertheless, in, um, the production, on the production side, we use filters that uh, perform interpolation, and for that case, it's good to have high-resolution res high audio. Another point is uh, conservation of, uh, of recordings. Uh, so if we store music digitally, then, of course, it's good to have a lot of uh, samples such that we can interpolate once there are errors arising. So, conclusion, there's no evidence-based research that supports audio quality claims of MQA. MQA is lossy because it reduces the bit depth and the frequency response. We see a degradation of audio quality which in its current version might not always be audible. The algorithm of MQA folding scheme is only vaguely described and its disadvantages for high-resolution high audio are obviously disguised by marketing slogans like deblurring. Once an MQA infrastructure is established, the audio quality can be easily scaled down. MQA's description of kernel optimization for each track song alludes to a perceptual coding scheme, which might eventually end up at uh, MP3 quality. Um, one thing to remember, there are free high-resolution res high audio codecs that compress audio losslessly, like FLAC. Internet bandwidth is not a big concern in the Western world anymore. It increases, hence there's no need to, for lossy audio coding. And most of the music, as Christoph already told us, is uh, still stored in CD quality. If we upsample those, um, those, that information, uh, signal-to-noise ratio decreases. Okay, thanks. All right, um, so thanks, Anton. Um, okay, I showed that. Good, so the question is, where is the DRM? Um, basically, Anton already has showed that um, MQA employs a clever encoding scheme. And um, as far as we know, because this is proprietary technology and we have to work with what we got, and that is reverse engineering by some people online and some of the papers and uh, um, other publications uh, that MQA makes. This is again from the paper that uh, Anton just mentioned from Stefan Hotto, um, where he um, drew up 
the MQA encoding scheme. And the important part, uh, I don't have a laser pointer here, but is uh, the PCM sample up there, which you can see is 24 bits. And as you can furthermore see, uh, it's divided into two parts. A baseband is the audio bits, and the subband is the data bits. So basically what MQA does is uh, using a 24-bit sample, um, throwing away 8 bits of that, more or less 8 bits of that, uh, audio information, and bury um, other stuff uh, basically in the noise floor that a 24-bit sample uh, allows for. <coughs> Give me a second. So, um, what, if you look at the history I just gave you on uh, digital audio, this is in a way back to square one. Because we had in 81 with the CD, Red Book Standard, 16 bits at 44.1 kilohertz. What we now would get with MQA is in their own words, right? Um, something to the extent of 15 to 17 bits of dynamic uh, bandwidth um, sampled at 48 kilohertz. Everything above 48 kilohertz um, is encoded in a lossy compression scheme, as Anton just showed. This is this folding, uh, what they talk about. How this actually is accomplished in detail, we don't know. It's uh, supposedly, uh, I, I guess it's a pretty clever way, because you have to basically get spectrum from 24 kilohertz to 96 kilohertz into just a few bits and bury that in the six, seven, eight bits that you get uh, with MKA compression. So, in a way, um, MQA uh, acknowledges that the standard that Sony and Philips arrived at, 16 bits 44.1K, is good enough for human hearing and all the information above 16 bit and above 44 or 48 kilohertz in that term is more or less useless, not audible. We can do something else with that. So, what do you do? What do you put there? Um, and it's a fairly complex and sophisticated cryptographic scheme. Oh wait, I forgot this one. This is the blue light on the <laughs> on the uh, on on one of these uh, MQA decks that lights up uh, when the file is authenticated. Um, and authentication, to remind you of that, that's a loaded term. Um, in the digital realm, it promises to verify the origin. Um, of the data, that so who is the sender, and the integrity of the data under the conditions of open networks, where data can be altered at any point in the transmission. And these re requirements can only be met via cryptographic claim, uh, means. Um, as the continu uh, continuous reports on hacked cryptos indicate, um, MQR has to come up with a workable and sufficiently secure system um, to, to, to make this possible. And MQA partnered with the German data security company Utimaco to create an authentication component for their format. Utimaco is a major uh, purveyor of cryptographic products and well established in the banking sector in Europe and also in the healthcare sector. And this is the website from Utimaco. So they offer lawful interception data retention services, which is nice to have. And they offer these hardware security uh, modules, which is actually what uh, MQA uh, uses. Um, Utimaco also published a white paper um, on MQA. It's available on the website. It's very sparse on details. But it suggests that MQA entails a public key infrastructure and that hardware security modules like these ones shown here uh, will be deployed in at least the MQA encoding houses and purportedly later on in the mastering studios. So um, the converters in those mastering studios would need to have uh, these hardware security modules uh, in them or some sort uh, um, of hardware security modules derived from, from these devices. And Utimaco was even so nice, where is it, um, to provide a hardware security modules for dummies book on their site, which apparently audio journalists so far haven't been able to find. Um, and these hardware secu uh, modu security modules basically provide the means to embed the necess necessary keys in the MQA encoded files. And the exact means of the scheme management schemes and the handling of the root of trust is unknown at this point. MQA might outsource this to Utimaco or might uh, use this crypto service that uh, um, do the key management. Okay, I have to come to an end. Um, uh, In-house. So, 
I'd like to ask the audience here, is this DRM? I don't hear anybody. I guess that means yes. Yes, okay. So I'm asking this because MQA claims, of course, um, it's otherwise. They say it's not uh, DRM, and here is from Ars Technica. Um, MQA has no DRM competent application outside of the studio. We have no opinion on this beyond nothing, noting that DRM is a futile exercise. Right? And this is like a large part of the narrative and the online debate, because MQA and, and all the people involved, including the audio press, keeps tooting this is not DRM, because you can copy the files. Right? But copy protection is just one form of DRM. The goal of DRM, um, if you just look it up on Wikipedia, for example, this is the first thing you see, is to manage the rights of a user with data, and this means both in the restrictive and the permissive uh, use cases. So MQA permits copying, but it restricts uh, uh, um, access to parts of the file, namely the higher resolution parts. Um, so in DRM parlance, that's conditional access, and the access is only granted if you have an MQA-capable digital audio converter which you have paid for, of course. So I guess what we can say is that MQA is something like a freemium model, right? You get the file that you can play on any kind of uh, converter or CD player, you can burn on CD, it actually would, uh, would be playable. Um, but if you want access to the premium part of that file, you have to buy a device uh, or software that allows that. Good. So why do they do that? Oh, one more point, and then I'm coming to end. Um, the firmware, as it has been um, uh, reverse engineered so far, shows that they actually have provisions in place for copy protection. Um, there are provisions there uh, to um, encrypt the files uh, and uh, with a SALSA 20 uh, uh, cipher, and there's also bridge trans transposition schemes in there. Why do they do this? Um, Jimmy Iovine just said to Apple Music uh, uh, boss that the streaming services have a bad situation, there's no margins, they don't make any money, so he's talking about Tidal, Spotify, and so forth. Um, whereas Amazon sells Prime, Prime, Apple sells telephones and iPads, and so forth. So the problem is that you have to sell something else ex outside of your streaming service in order to make money, which of course Apple is in a good place. Um, Amazon is currently the biggest speaker uh, company in the world with these kinds of devices, and Google is catching up. So our interpretation of what MQI is trying to do is it's trying to generate a new licensing stream um, for the music industry, or specifically for MQA. Um, these elements of the music production, distribution, consumption value chain would need MQA licenses. The recording software and plugins, the recording mastering studios with new converters, the artists uh, would get their um, back catalogs uh, remastered and uh, would have to agree on that. Streaming services would have to sign up with them. Uh, physical media manufacturers, if it comes to that, and of course all the hi-fi manufacturers uh, and end customers also uh, are looking um, at uh, paying MQR. Okay, I skip all this. Um, why is it clever and why is it stealth? I think the encoding schemes uh, that uh, MQR employs uh, make very clever use of the space afforded by 24-bit samples, uh, namely um, to stealthily introduce a DRM in the uh, music uh, um, production, distribution, and consumption uh, value chain, and they don't openly talk about it, and they make it actually very, very difficult to find these elements. And um, if you ask what to do to what in this context of the uh, conference here, it would be worthwhile if people start to dig deeper on what MQA is actually doing. Okay, I'll just stop here. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the talk. We have now like five minutes for questioning and answering, so please line up to the microphones. And do we have a question from the internet? No. <laughs> so microphone number one. Hello, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, you talked about the reverse engineering of the firmware, so it like somehow sounds that they wouldn't have these complicated hardware security modules in the DAX. 
Well, um, the f it's a specific firmware in uh, one product that has been reverse engineered from Blue Sound. Um, I don't know uh, the security provisions of that, but um, this hardware security modules won't be at this point part of the consumer products. They will be part of the converters in the encoding house and uh, the distribution uh, context. Um, how the exact uh, uh, crypto works um, between the MQA files and uh, um, the consumer DAX uh, is not yet known. There's, there's some hints and indications, you will find this in these resources, of how that works. Um, but the hardware security models would be employed in the, in the production distribution uh, part of the, um, uh, of the scheme. Okay, thanks. Yeah. We have another question from microphone number four. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I have two questions. One of them is, um, do you think that this marketing concept will have any success at all? And the second one is, um, do you think that um, music encoding does evolve anywhere else than multi-channel encoding instead of uh, increasing f uh, sample rate and sample bits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Uh, I think this um, this is a good example of how not to market something because I cannot think of any product that has managed to create more doubt with both the consumers of, of this product and also hardware manufacturers and, and all kinds of other people which are involved in digital audio than MQA. I think they went out um, with very bold claims, uh, tried to play the audio files uh, with their easy, uh, easy suggestibility uh, and were surprised by the competence in the audience. So uh, I don't think this will go anywhere in, in these terms. Uh, what was your second question again? Um, about how the encoding of music oh. evolves if we are going for more channels like uh, five channels, eight channels, maybe uh, 16 channels at some point, yeah. um, or do some people still try to increase the f uh, bit rate and uh, um, frequency? Yeah, so um, it's probably a question for Anton. Um, I can only, uh, as an audiophile, answer this. Uh, in the audiophile market, multi-channel audio is dead. It's stereo, right? I mean, for the consumers, this is why I showed this Bluetooth speaker. Everybody's happy with mono now, um, and that doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, stereo files will have, uh, audio files will have stereo setups, uh, and multi-channel setups create problems with rooms and, you know, calibration, all kinds of things. Um, it might be different in the AV sector. Um, in more general terms, I think audio is a solved problem, really. 24 bits and 192 kilohertz should, should be enough. Um, the frontier now is room correction and, and face correction with speakers. So that's where the real problems are and where there's actually real progress. Digital, um, um, how do you call it, Weichen? Uh, oh. Crossovers, yes, digital crossovers, these kinds of things. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can add uh, parametric coding is used in multi-channel audio. So you send one mono signal and then you can uh, reproduce by parameters a, a room uh, for, um, for a multi-channel uh, setup. Yeah, that's often used. Thanks. Uh, I think we have time for another question. Do we? Yeah, okay. Another question from microphone oh, number one. Story. I, I went to three conferences on digital audio and computer music this year. I didn't hear anybody mention this. Mm -hmm. MQA. I think the story about the authentic, uh, authenticity. Authentication? Yes. What, what did you call it? Okay, can you step sorry, a bit uh, okay, forward? Sorry, it's, it's fabulous. I wonder if they, do they make any claims that do like virtual analog models of the original converters? Or how do, how, this story is just completely, it's like crazy, no? Yeah. <laughs> it actually is being mentioned in the MQA marketing model that they, f they call it fingerprint, the or original analog digital converter, and compensate for, defi for the deficiencies and errors this converter makes. And that's one of the big claims, it, that there is a device-specific compensation embedded in the MQA file uh, being called upon upon replay and, and hence uh, a better quality uh, experience uh, for the listener. But 
all the evidence so far shows that this is absolutely not true. What we have is a pair song encoding, just like you would have an MP3 or something else. The encoder apparently analyzes the file, the, the song or the track, um, and makes certain provisions on how to fold the signal, so how many bits get allocated uh, in the dynamic range um, um, on a pair track basis. So there is no authentication or fingerprinting or any kind of modeling of the uh, analog part or the D uh, AD part uh, uh, in the chain. Thank you very much for the questioning and thanks again very much for the talk. Thanks. Thanks.